This week on Quadriga, African Exodus, who is to blame? Millions of people in Africa are fleeing their homelands, trying to escape violence and poverty. They say they have no future in the countries where they were born. The migrants risk their lives and sacrifice everything they possess for the chance to make it to Europe, America and other parts of the world. African countries are losing whole generations of young people. So who's responsible for the mass exodus? Coming to you from Berlin, Quadriga, the international debate. Your host this week, Melinda Crane. Hello and welcome to Quadriga. The refugee crisis here in Europe has been dominating the headlines for weeks, with much of the attention focused on Syrians. But the largest share of those who are fleeing to the West are Africans, and we want to take a look this week at their situation with three African guests. It's my pleasure to welcome Richard Kamis. He's a journalist from South Sudan who came to Germany for his studies and went on to work for the German broadcaster Mitteldeutsche Rundfunk. He says many African migrants are young and well-educated. The exodus will do lasting damage to the economies of Africa. And it's great to have Veya Tata with us. She was born in Cameroon and has lived in Germany for many years. She's an entrepreneur and the editor-in-chief of Africa Positive magazine. She says many policies of the West and bad governments in some African countries contribute to the exodus of African youth. And our third guest is Usman Shehu. He's a journalist from Nigeria who works on Deutsche Welle's Africa desk in Bonn. And he says it's not only corrupt leaders who are to blame. Many people in Africa refuse to pay tax. They need to change their attitude toward government. So I had the honor to moderate the OECD's Africa Forum yesterday here in Berlin. And we heard there one African leader and one European leader after another telling us the growth prospects in Africa haven't looked so good in a long, long time. And despite the fact that, of course, there are conflicts in several countries, the fact is that the number of war victims is also a good deal lower than it has been in a long time. So, Beatata, explain that paradox, if you would, please. Africa on an upswing and yet thousands of people leaving? Uh, yeah, the reality is uh, the growth uh, rate, it doesn't trickle down, the profits don't trickle down to the bottom of the pyramid. And why is that? Because uh, you see uh, that most of the profits that are coming into the African countries are from the extractive industries. And in these extractive industries, there are only one or two percent uh, uh, em employment taking place there. So it means the majority of the African population is not being employed. And that's why, you see, a lot of them don't have perspective. Without jobs, they have to go out uh, to countries where they hope that they have a better living uh, st standard. So that's the problem that we have, that we hear 10% growth, 12% growth, Ethiopia there, but yet, a lot of people don't have jobs in these countries. Usman Shehu, it's common to talk about push and pull factors. In other words, to ask, are the refugees fleeing from an unbearable situation or are they fleeing to a perceived promised land? And that distinction, of course, is relevant to a lot of politicians here in Europe because they ask whether they need to do something to decrease the pull factor. How do you see it? I think it is both uh, because uh there are some people that they have to leave their country because there's no way of living, because of conflict. There are people who come here because they want to make a good living. Uh, when I start to say, for example, in Nigeria, uh, you have people who are, a lot of Nigerians are in Europe, but the Nigerians who are in Europe are rich people compared to the people in villages who live with poverty, who live with hunger. They don't have if you can be able to pay the, these traffickers money, it means you are rich. But the poor people who don't have what to eat two times a day, they cannot be able to pay these people who are trafficking them. They don't even have the money to pay transport from Nigeria to Niger to Libya and come to Europe. So there are different people. For example, if you have refugees from countries where there is war, where there is a lot of drought, like Niger Republic, they have a lot of drought. But I'm sure Nigeria have more refugees than Niger Republic here in Germany. Why? Because the Nigerians who come here are not Nigerians who are poor, are Nigerians who are rich. But there are people who have conflict. When you look uh, in uh, some areas, uh, like in Sudan and so on, people 
don't have chance of living. They have to live because it's not because they don't have business. You are in the village doing your farming, but the farming is being denied by war. Even in northeastern part of Nigeria, we have this. So that's the difference. Let's come back to that in just a second. I want to take a closer look at some of those push factors, at some of the things that cause people to leave. But one more question about the pull side, uh, Richard Hamas. When we look at the role of the media, as I said, the pull question uh, applies to politicians. Should they be doing something more to let people in Africa know that perhaps the prospects here aren't as good as they think? But also to the media, what kind of picture are people in Africa getting of the journey, if they, if they decide to migrate, of the journey itself and also of the prospects that await them here, the likelihood, for example, that they will, in fact, be given permanent asylum? Yeah, I mean, that's, that's where the problem begins. Um, the picture that we, people in Africa get is a very positive one. Um, Europe is very rich. That's what they see. Um, Europe has got all kind of facilities that, you know, human being can, you know, think of. And... Um, there's no hunger in Europe. It's, um, you get hospitals, you get in functioning infrastructures. Everything's correct here. Everything's fine. That's the picture that they get down there. Nobody will tell them that um, there is unemployment in this country or in this continent. Nobody will tell them that if you, know, you don't have money, you will starve and nobody will give you food. Nobody's telling them that you know, even if you're going to a doctor, you have to, you know, to pay your, you, you know, your part you know, for treatment. You have to buy medicine as well. Nobody tells them that. And what so, about the journey? How much information do they have about how dangerous this journey is? Uh, well, to be honest with you, they have very, very little information about that, you see. They see the bigger picture, the, be the brighter picture. You know, they see um, heaven. <laughs> and, you know, to reach heaven, you know, you can do whatever you want uh, just to take that journey, to take that boat, to reach that uh, destination. But they... they um, the risks on the way, nobody cares. You know, because some people even say that, hey, I'm already dead. So why can't I just you know, give it a try? Interesting that all of you have emphasized the fact that the refugees are not necessarily the poorest and the most downtrodden. Let's take a closer look now at who's leaving and why. This man wants only one thing, to get to Europe. Like many Nigerians, he's fleeing poverty and Boko Haram terrorism. More than 12,000 Nigerians have tried to make it to Europe by sea this year alone, often with fatal results. Along with South Africa, Nigeria has Africa's most powerful economy. The country is rich in natural resources but fails to exploit its potential. Most Nigerians exist in bitter poverty and the population is growing dramatically. The country has 170 million inhabitants. Nigeria has massive problems with pollution, child labor, and religious strife. It's a very explosive mix. German and European migration policy is based on making a distinction between those who leave fleeing war and persecution and those who leave as economic migrants looking for a better life. So I'd like to talk a little bit about the degree to which that distinction holds. We saw there somebody who's leaving for a number of different reasons. Perhaps I can ask Usman to get us started. You are Nigerian. Perhaps would you share with us why you left and whether you think those categories of of war and persecution on the one hand and economic migration on the other really hold up? Um, yes, um, like I just said uh, before, in a country like Nigeria, those who are coming, for example, in the report they discussed that uh, the person leave uh, where Boko Haram is. If you live in those areas, you don't have way of living. Yes, I agree. But the majority of Nigerians who are in the West are not coming from the northeastern part of the country where the conflict is. Majority of the Nigerians who pass through Libya, through uh, this uh, hardship, who sacrifice their life, are not people who are coming from the conflict. Are Nigerians who live in cities who see their friends or their uh, relatives who live in West already made it and they already have a good houses, they already have a good of living. They see that people who have family in Europe, they send money every month or every week or when there's any occasion, they see them, they are wealthy people. So 
these people, if we want to see whether there are people who come from conflict or people who come from rich, I will say majority of Nigerians who leave to come here are people who come because they want to make a good living, because they want to get rich, because they are unsatisfied from what they get. But there are more poorer people in the villages, they are still in the villages, because they don't even have money to pay to come to the cities. Mayor Tata, would you say that's right in your experience as well? Um, well, uh, yes, so somehow that's right. Uh, but I think uh, we have to look at these uh, migration policies from Europe. Why isn't it possible that the Europeans uh, create a policy where African youths who are uh, educated have a chance to come legally and work in Europe? I mean, we have, uh, um, I mean, we see Europeans can go legally and work in different parts of the continent all over the world. So why can't Europe create this opportunity for Africans too. You know, so I think it's, um, it's a one-way uh, game. We Europeans, we have the right to go everywhere, but others don't have the right to come to us. So I think it's, it's something that the African continent also has, you know, uh, to debate it out with, with the European government and make sure that we have legal ways of migration. Because if we have these legal ways of migration, we are going to stop, uh, you know, the illegal. To in reduce it, you cannot stop it completely, but you will reduce in it. In fact, right. of course, Germany's uh, uh, labor minister has said she would like to create, I think, 25,000 visas for economic migrants, uh, saying she believes that that would limit the illegal flow. Do you really think that's true, though? Um, 25,000 is really, really, really small. I mean, we have to, face, we have to face the reality. Anybody who has no perspective, no matter where he or she is living, always tries to get out, to get a better living. It doesn't, it doesn't matter from which continent you are. That's why you have, migration has always been there and it will continue. So I think the best way is to make sure that the Europeans make sure that the decisions they take here in Europe or the decisions the German government takes, it doesn't affect the living standards of other countries negatively. Because as long as we have profit from, uh, from our economic activities, but to the detriment of different countries, it's going to lead to the migration of the youths from this country. Let's come back to the role of uh, the market and the role of industry a, a little bit later. But for, perhaps uh, first, uh, again, a closer look at some of the reasons people have for leaving. Southern Sudan, uh, uh, certainly a country that you know very well, Richard Kamis. How does this balance between conflict and persecution on the one hand and economic betterment on the other play out there? Uh, well, I mean, when we talk about South Sudan, the main concern is, of course, the conflict, the armed conflict. And um, <clears throat> that's why they're fleeing away, right? And, but they don't come to Europe. These are very, very improvised people. As my friend, my friend uh, Sehu said, they can't even afford um, a, you know, a ticket to, 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 to leave that place uh, to, to, the to, 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 to Libya, for example, and take the boat to come to Europe. They can't afford that. So uh, basically what, what they do is to, they run in, you know, to the neighboring countries and this, uh, where they take refuge. Um, the, the economic aspect of that doesn't play any very big role for Southern Sudanese at the moment. We were together at that Africa Forum I mentioned a bit earlier, uh, Veya Tata, and uh, both of us heard one African leader after another expressing distress about the fact that so many uh, Africans are leaving the continent. Um, did that satisfy you? Are they doing enough, these uh, leaders, to actually prevent <laughs> the exodus? I don't think so. I mean, all politicians are the same, you know, because unfortunately uh, they are not doing their job rightly. In some African countries, we have good politicians who are trying to do the job or who are trying to tackle the challenges uh, that they face back home. But uh, to my opinion, in many African countries, we have politicians, they don't just care what uh, the majority of the population is going through. And that's the problem in most African countries. Because, um, uh, you know, uh, the problem of uh, ethnicity is a very big problem that is, uh, how do you say, um, uh, an obstacle to the development of many African countries. Because when a leader comes to power, he doesn't think I'm the leader of the whole nation. He thinks I'm the leader of this ethnic group. We have to stop that. We have to grow over that. We have to be responsible for, the, for, for everybody who is living in that country. And if we don't change that, we Africans, nobody from out, 
outside is going to help us solve our problems back home. You know, because you have to have the responsibility to care that um, uh, everybody in your country gets clean water, good health services, good roads to go through. It doesn't matter where they come from. It doesn't matter what language they speak. So I think that's something that we have to start there. And money is not only the issue. We need to change our mindset in order to develop our countries. Poor governance is, of course, often, often cited as one of the major push factors that are driving people to leave Africa. One African entrepreneur decided that perhaps he could create an incentive for good governance by, by awarding a prize for it. And he only uh, discovered after he had established his prize that it's not all that easy to find a winner. In 2007, former Mozambique President Joachim Shisano became the first head of state to receive the Ibrahim Prize for Excellence in African Leadership. The prize has only been awarded four times. Most recently, in 2014, to ex namibian President Hifikapunya Pohamba. There aren't many suitable recipients. Many African heads of state simply change their country's constitutions to avoid having to leave office when their time is up. Leading the way is Teodoro Obiang. In 1979, he launched a putsch and took over Equatorial Guinea. He's been in power for 36 years, longer than any other African head of state. Not far behind is Robert Mugabe. The authoritarian ruler of Zimbabwe is 90 years old and has been in office for 35 years. They're just two examples of power-hungry autocrats lording over African countries. Usman Shehu, your opening statement saying that people don't, don't pay taxes indicated that you think it's not only the leaders to blame, but also the citizens. They are a part of the bad governance. Is that right? Yes, uh, because uh, most countries in Africa, people look at leaders. People think that it's the only government can do for me. I don't think what I can offer the government. Here in Europe, everybody know that I must pay my tax. When I'm working or if I have a car, this car must have a good license. And the problem in Africa, the few companies that are, it is compulsory for them to pay tax, this tax money is not going to the government uh, treasury. So that's the problem uh, people have, that they think I, it's only the government, I need hospital, I need route, but I don't think where, what is my own responsibility to give to, so that the government is able to do this route for me. But of course, uh, isn't it bad elites who set the example there by putting their own money uh, abroad in Swiss bank accounts and so on? Uh, I know that your new president in Nigeria or Nigeria's new president was elected partly because he was perceived to be immune to corruption, President Buharu. However, he was quite authoritarian uh, in his previous time in power. Do you really expect that he can turn things around in Nigeria? Uh, first of all, uh, I believe he will change. But uh, before I go into that, I don't believe he is authoritarian. Why do I say I don't believe? There are many head of state in Nigeria, past one, who were more authoritarian than him, but it is not reported. For example, the last president, Obasanjo, who is a civilian government, during his civilian, he even arrested two cities, two villages were arrested down completely. Nobody is talking about his authoritarian. So, Yes, I agree. Uh, there were so many people in, in Buhari's first tenure who were prosecuted, but when they were found not guilty in court, they were released. And that's what happened even in the West. So the truth about, uh, yes, he was elected, he doesn't have money. And we see now, I'm not campaigning for anybody, but he has started to, to shoot change. Good example is electricity. One of the major problems of Nigeria is electricity. Now, in many cities, in villages, I was there myself, I saw this electricity. People even have forgotten putting foil in their generators to, to, to light their houses. Even we even saw a report of those who are selling generators are complaining now their market is going down. <laughs> so a lot of industries shut down. For example, 60% of industries in cities like Kano or Lagos, they shut down in the last 10 years because there's no electricity. Most of the foreign companies that are working in Nigeria, they use generators to, 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 to foil their uh, industry, to foil their machines, because there's no uh, national grid. We saw mm -hmm. that has changed. And the president already, the economic itself, when he came, Nigeria territory was so empty. 
He did not do any magic, but we see now Nigerian uh, economic is getting up. So there is a lot of hope and expectation. If Africa will get people like him, definitely things will change because he's just less than 100 days and we are seeing some few changes. Mr. Kamis, one of the absolute critical aspects of good governance would be jobs. Africa has a tremendously young population. It needs millions and millions of new jobs every year all across the continent. Why is it so hard to create those jobs? Well, um, <clears throat> the people responsible for job creation are the people governing the country. Um, you know, it's, it's, Africa is um, underdeveloped, right? Um, we need infrastructures. Um, you cannot entrust an individual businessman, you know, to create roads, railways in, you know, in, the, in the whole country or in the whole con continent. It's, it's the, the task of the government, the task of those people in power, to create such infrastructures. And now, for an infrastructure, what do you need? You need people who are able to, you know, uh, do something, to, to, to run machines, for example, to pave places, to, you know, to drive tractors. And these are the young people who are supposed to be doing that. But these people have been trained, you see. And who should put that scheme into place? It's the government. It's not the private person or the private businessman. It's the government, first of all. Good governance, big topic in the development community, big topic at that forum we attended yesterday. How much can development cooperation do to put pressure on African leaders? How much can good governance be promoted from outside? It's difficult to promote it from outside because I think um, it is uh, a problem in the society. As you said before, uh, the mindset of, of a society, because it, when we have societies in Africa where those who do wrong, those who acquire illicit money are those uh, whom the people admire, then that's a problem because we need honest society. We need society where we can stand up and say, you did the wrong thing, go in for it. But in most of the society, those who really do the wrong things are those who have been pushed up. So we have to change something in our mindset. We have to, we have to make sure that those who have the job, you talked about the youth. We have a lot of educated youth, but they are not put at the position to take the right decision. They will take somebody who is uh, in the ruling party, he will prefer to take his brother, who is not qualified That's to true. go and do the job. That's so true. we have to be rational, we have to stop those type of uh, behaviors that are contraproductive to our own nations, you know? So I think uh, it's very, very important that we take this decision. Osman so. Shehu, many of the leaders at uh, yesterday's forum were saying, look, we want to do better, but the fact is the deck is stacked against us. The markets, the agricultural, the whole agricultural global economy is all working to the benefit of major Western firms and Western players. There's little we can do to solve our own problems. Would you agree with that? Uh, well, uh, I think uh, Africa has uh, its own uh, problem, but I think Africans can do it alone. Uh, why in the last 30, uh, about 20 years back, the uh, late president of Burkina Faso said, we don't need cotton from anywhere, and I don't wear any clothes except made in Burkina Faso. So if in the last 20 years, he has this dream, and he knows that Burkina Faso can produce a cotton that he don't need to buy clothes outside, then definitely they will do it. Secondly, we saw a lot of presidents in Africa, they just come to re get rich. We have to stop this, because people just come to rich, not to rule, not to... Uh, people come to power without any plan. That if I become a president of this country, my plan is this and that, no and vision. I want to achieve That's this... Right within my time limit. But people come to get rich. That is why we think that the Europe companies are the only one, and the European companies, their own fault is any head of state come to power, he has the right to bring money into Europe, including Nigeria. We saw how many money from late Abacha that were stuck in Germany, that were stuck in Switzerland. But Germany did not do anything to say any corrupt penny, any corrupt dollars is not allowed to come to my country, mm -hmm. then we will continue seeing people like Abacha because they know they are being protected. Mm -hmm.
at und highest levels. Just right. Last word, Richard Kamis. Our title asks, who's to blame? Let's turn that around. Who can change it? We said development assistance only partially. Change has to come from within civil society in African countries. What can they do and what do they need? Uh, well, I mean, they can also play, a, you know, a positive role trying to, you know, to change the mindset of the people. But it's not only civil society. Everybody, each and everybody in Africa has got a role to play. I'm talking about the government, the civil society, educated class, even the farmer. But, you know, they have to change their mindset, you know, to think about, to put the, the continent first and then, you know, personal interest. Thank you. I'm afraid we have to leave it right there. <laughs> Thanks for joining us. Thanks to you all out there for tuning in. See you soon.